Why did she wear that dress to Jamaica? That question started it all. My wife's trip to Jamaica, meant to be a vacation, turned into the scene of her betrayal. Little did she know, I had already started piecing together the puzzle of her infidelity. The plan I devised in response, a staged kidnapping, was meant to be my revenge, a way to humiliate her and her lover in the most public way possible. But as the events unfolded, the line between justice and vengeance blurred. This is my story. Enjoy watching it. Malcolm James wasn't the darkest man I'd ever met, but he was among the top ten. Actually, he wasn't that dark. He just appeared that way, quite if he wasn't quite six feet tall. He always made a strong impression. Perhaps it was the constant snarl on his face or the countless scars that appeared to have a bluish tint to them. He was not someone you would want to meet in a dark alley. I felt fortunate to have him at my side. My name is John Ellison. I run a tiny firm called Divinity Selling, which packages and distributes big volumes of DVDs, CDs, and other similar things. It is labor-intensive work, and finding individuals to perform it for minimum wage is nearly impossible. Do not be misled by the name. There's nothing heavenly about it. We are able to hire folks who appreciate the opportunity, but are now on the verge of becoming illegal by exploiting various obvious gaps in federal and state legislation. My staff is largely Jamaicans, including Malcolm, with a few Dominicans and Haitians mixed in. Despite their appreciation for the task, they occasionally slacked off. It was tough to keep them all functioning to their maximum potential until I grasped the importance of Malcolm James. I watched him carefully for almost two weeks before deciding to contact him. He was articulate and talked with what I assumed was a beautiful British accent. But what did I know about the accents? He beamed warmly when I gave him the position of shop supervisor. It was, to put it mildly, disturbing. The new job included a good raise and, of course, a few fringe benefits that none of the floor workers received. I had the impression that there was more to him than appeared. However, I was not intrigued enough to ask any questions. Productivity grew by about 30%. I was pleased. The corporation was pleased, as was Malcolm. He appeared to be where he was supposed to be. It was difficult to explain. The company was now operating smoothly. If things go as planned, we should be able to continue operations for at least another 18 months before being shut down for state or federal violations. This was my sixth similar business venture in the past 10 years. It paid well, but it wasn't really a career prospect. I saved as much as I could in case of a downturn. The good news was that I generally had another operation ready to go when one shut down. I can't remember how I got into this line of business. I was never considered a mainstream type of man. Doing things the traditional way was monotonous and predictable, not exactly what I was hoping for. My younger brother Bobby was quite the contrary. The most essential aspect of his life was his union work with the local energy company. He knew where and when his next paycheck was coming from, and he was okay with that. I felt thrilled for him, but not envious. Bobby and I married our high school sweethearts. That's boring and nowhere near as romantic as it appears. Bobby and Cora had twin boys who recently turned 16. My wife Doreen and I had a daughter, Ariel, who had recently been accepted to Duke, and a 17-year-old son, Roger who was doing everything he could to get into a military college. He wasn't too concerned about where he went, but he was determined. Cora worked for one of the local insurance claim companies. They processed claims for more than 20 small insurance businesses in the tri-state area. Doreen had no interest in going to work, and I was content with the way things were. We had enough to get by, and I believed that a comfortable, happy home life was more important to the family than extra money. And that was all. Pleasantville was a pleasant place to live. It wasn't truly Pleasantville, but I remembered the name from an old movie and always associated it with perfection. Life was good. That is, until I decided to go down to the super mall and get some office supplies. I had a gal to do that, but I was constantly seeking for reasons to leave the office. I knew exactly what I wanted before leaving the workplace, so the shopping went quickly. I do not generally browse. I grab what I need, pay, and leave. The Keystone Mall was a massive two-story structure with an open atrium in the center. I'm assuming it's an atrium because I'm not sure what the proper term is. 
I was sitting at a booth on the second level food court, overlooking the first floor, when I noticed Cora and Doreen walking down the middle. Cora had apparently taken off work so that she and Doreen could do some last minute shopping before their small girl trip. After much begging, pleading, and bribery, Bobby and I agreed to let Cora and Doreen enjoy a five day vacation to an all inclusive resort in Jamaica near Montego Bay. Bobby, we're no longer crazy about the idea, but eventually consented to it. If they agree to stay at the resort and not go about the island unaccompanied, they would leave in two days. I was ready to scream out and wave at them when something stopped me. They paused in front of a Victoria's Secret store. Neither of them was used to this venue. I sat back down and calmly observed as they entered the store without hesitation. Interesting. That's quite fascinating. I bought a fresh cup of coffee and sat as comfortably as I could in one of those cheap plastic seats. They emerged at least 20 minutes later. I wasn't able to hear them, but I could tell they were laughing and joking as they left. Instead of leaving, they sat on the bench outside the store. Each of them took some items from the Victoria's secret bag and placed them in a Walmart bag. They emptied the Victoria's secret bags into the trash can at the end of the bench and then walked along the mall to escape. They were still giggling as they left. It took me less than a minute to get down the escalator and to the rubbish container. I did not even try to be discreet. I just removed the lid of the can and reached inside. I left the mall without replacing the top of the garbage can. I suppose that was inconsiderate. Chuckle. Chuckle. I waited until I got out of the car before looking inside the bags. I'm not sure what I was looking for because they had taken whatever they had purchased. I wasn't sure which bag was which, but each contained a couple sales pamphlets and a receipt. They'd each purchased two pairs of baby doll sleepers. One bill was for $1.65 and another for $1.72. Both were paid for in cash. Dory never spends cash for anything anymore. Everything goes on credit cards. Needless to say, she had caught my eye. I didn't want to jump to conclusions before I had the opportunity to face her. Actually, I wasn't intending to confront her, but rather give her an opportunity to explain the purchases. I had to assume that she had purchased them expressly for her impending vacation, which Bobby and I would not be taking. Driving back to work. I noticed gloomy clouds on the horizon, but the sun was still shining. I was pouting at my desk, trying to figure out where I'd gone wrong, when Malcolm James stepped in. Mr. Ellison, something doesn't seem right. Is there a problem I should be aware of? No, Mr. James, this is not a problem that should concern you. Everything is fine on the floor and at work. You have nothing to be concerned about with a move for him to sit. He was smiling, but there was still an anxious expression on his face. We sat silently for a few moments. Mr. James, where in Jamaica are you from? I'm from Falmouth, although I spent the majority of my time in the Montego Bay area. Why is this interesting to you? I paused briefly and rocked back in my chair. Have you any pals in the Montego Bay area? I have many acquaintances, but very few pals. I also know some unfriendly folks there. In fact, that is why I am here at this time. I dipped into my bottom desk drawer and pulled out a bottle of Jack Daniels in two glasses. The glasses were not particularly clean, but they were clearly useful. Malcolm James did not object when I pushed the filled glass in his direction. Is it a financial problem? He said, and smiled. Yes, it's not much. Only $10,000 USD, yet enough to compel me to seek safer surroundings. He observed me smiling, and I believe he realized it wasn't because of his circumstances, but because of what I was thinking. Mr. Ellison appears to be in need of my assistance and is attempting to determine how we may mutually benefit. Am I right? I found it amusing that he addressed me in the third person and laughed slightly. Mr. James, do you have any unsavory friends or acquaintances? Now he was laughing. Of course, Mr. Ellison, they all are. We were both smiling as I filled the cups for the second time. We sat quietly for what seemed like several minutes, but could have been shorter. Tomorrow, Mr. James, tomorrow we will aid each other. He grinned again as he stood up to depart, and I noticed the gold teeth on the right side towards the back. I thought it was ominous. That night we had a family meal. Ariel informed everyone that she could begin a summer session at Duke if she left within a week. Dorian was not happy with the proposal, but he was outvoted. Roger had planned to spend a year at the Marine Military Academy in Harlingen, Texas before attending college. 
I had previously rejected the idea due to the expense, but tonight I felt differently. When I expressed my support for Roger's suggestion, Doreen gave me an unusual look but said nothing. After the youngsters had left the table, I asked her about her day. Cora and I got the final few items we needed for the trip. I received the cutest little flip-flops. We chose not to bring a camera since we were concerned about losing it. We each received new two-piece swimming suits that were a touch on the modest side. We're not young, you know. I grinned slightly at the way she was chatting. She was nervous. And when that happens, she has a tendency to talk excessively. If I let her chatter on, she might trip herself. But I had already received the answer I was waiting for. She said nothing about the excursion to Victoria's secret, not even hinting at it. She kept talking, but I was no longer paying attention. She eventually recognized what she was doing and shut up. It was too late. She gave it away without saying anything. It would have been so simple to confront her, yet it would have yielded nothing. There was much more going on than just a visit to a posh lady's store. Dorian was mostly quiet for the remainder of the evening. I could sense she was uncomfortable with her discussion session. Any further conversation on her behalf would have only made matters worse. Dorian was setting up the DVR to record programs while she was away. When I started looking at tuition fees and total assets, it was not a pretty picture. I would require at least $55,000 per year for Ariel and $34,000 for Rogers one year of high school. I chose to prepay four years for Ariel, but only one year for Roger, which would leave me with less than $15,000 in the bank. I could figure out Roger's college plans later. Hell, he had no idea where he was heading. I gathered all of the addresses I needed and prepared letters in envelopes. The next day, all I needed to do was go to the bank and make a few phone calls. Maybe I rushed things. Maybe there wasn't a problem. My fear was based solely on a trip to the mall and a nasty feeling in my stomach. Dorian had already gone to bed when I decided to contact Bobby. He would constantly stay up to watch Letterman. Bobby, are you still awake? Yes, sir. Brother John, what can I do for you? Is Letterman on yet? Nope. There are ten minutes to go. Talk quickly, Bobby. I do not wish to offend you, but has Corbin been acting odd lately? Do not jerk me around. John, what's going on? You know, tiny things that don't seem kosher. You mean like the Tupperware and Magic Chef parties? Maybe. Why are they funny? Cora and Doreen have been attending these events on a regular basis, along with book club meetings and card parties. Yeah, so what? Cora does not read much. She dislikes playing cards and never buys anything at those awful gatherings. Have you said anything to her? Hell no. I didn't want to risk damaging my marriage. What do you mean, John? If I accused her or even hinted at something and was proven false, my life would be a living hell. I'm not saying anything till I know a little more. Did she show you what she bought while shopping today? Yeah, a swimsuit, sandals, and floppy hat. Why, I was simply wondering. There was an awkward pause in the conversation, which I eventually broke. Bobby, is that guy from high school still working in the people department at Continental Claims Associates? Yes, I think so. Why? Could you phone him tomorrow to see if any other firm employees are on vacation at the same time? Cora's. John, what the hell is going on, Bobby? I do not know. I just know something isn't right. Doreen doesn't have many opportunity to meet guys, but Cora does. This vacation to Jamaica looks a little strange to me. Perhaps I should just speak to Cora. No way, Bobby. Whatever you do, say nothing to her. Okay? Okay. I will call him. I've got to go immediately. Letterman is starting. I slept on the couch that night. There was no special reason, but I didn't feel like jumping into bed with Doreen. I canceled two money market accounts and redeemed three certificates of deposit. I contacted all of the relevant agencies at Duke and the Harlingen Military School before having cashier's checks set up for tuition and other expenses. I took cash. I left $2,000 in my checking account. Before lunch, I had paid for Ariel's four years of college and Roger's year at a posh military school. As I was leaving the post office, Bobby John called me. You were correct. What is this about? All of it. Curry in the personnel office informed me that Cora had been playing patty cakes with one of the auditors, a man named Calvin Bostick. It's common knowledge in the company, so I'm not sure why I hadn't heard about it before. Anyway, Calvin and a buddy of his, Addison Eberly, are enjoying a vacation at the same time as Cora. Damn that. I was terrified of something like that. 
Can you tell me anything about those guys besides their names? I did that already, John. I'll email you a few company ID images over the phone. The man with the glasses is Bostic. Thank you, Bobby. Hello, dude. I apologize for all of this. Do not apologize to me, John. My wife is the one that got Doreen into this predicament. Bobby, please meet me after work at the peanut bar. We have some things to talk about. Gotcha. Good afternoon. It must be pleasant to be the boss. Malcolm James was smiling when I stepped into my office. I simply smiled back without saying anything. Gloria, my secretary, had brought in two cups of coffee. Malcolm kindly waited while I transferred the two photographs from my phone to the computer. In two minutes, he had a hard copy in his hand and a photo of each individual on his phone. He sat with a nasty little smirk on his face, anticipating what was to come. Mr. James, can we get down to business now? Most absolutely, Mr. Elliot. It took less than an hour to reach an agreement and decide on a price. He and I were both thrilled. However, Bobby might not be thrilled when I informed him how much a portion of all this would cost. Bobby threw a little bomb at me when we met after work. He had planned to visit our Uncle Grant in Tennessee for an undetermined period of time. Bobby, don't you think that is a tad drastic given the circumstances? Last night I was up thinking about things. Today I called half a dozen people to confirm my suspicions regarding Corker's activity. It's not overly drastic, John. If anything, it's a touch late. Sorry, Bobby, I never realized. It looks that I didn't understand what was going on in my own marriage either. What exactly is wrong with us? John, why did they do this? And why didn't we see it coming? For the next several seconds, we sat peacefully, munching on peanuts and drinking warm beer. I ordered some more cold ones and grinned at my brother. How may I help you, Bobby? What can I do? We are okay, John. I have a little trailer lined up. The boys and I will pack up most of what we will need, and we should arrive in Tullahoma by the end of the next day. How about your job? You enjoy that work. I know it was a difficult decision to make. I've already called Grant. He assured me that I would be able to find work there. Whatever it is, it will not include all of the fancy union benefits. But my boys and I will be able to get by. I'll be taking all of our savings and investments with me when we go. What are you planning to tell Cora? I'll write her a message mentioning that we went to Alaska. I've always mentioned visiting there, so she might be gullible enough to believe it, at least for a while. Yeah. That reminds me, Bobby. You owe me $4,000. What? What the heck do I owe you $4,000 for? Bobby, you've got to trust me. The money is wisely spent, and it's best if you don't know anything else. Will I receive it back? Probably not. Crap. I decided to give Doreen another chance to come clean after dinner that night. The outcome was no better this time. She did remark that because her cell phone wouldn't function there, she was going to leave it at home. She told me to assume everything was fine unless I heard otherwise. If there was an issue, she pledged to find a way to notify me. Doreen was going to spend the evening packing for her trip, so I decided to take the kids bowling. The notion elicited a lot of moans and eye-rolling, which subsided when I shook my head and ran my finger across my lips. We went to the bowling alley, but never bowled. I didn't want to do it, but I knew I had to. At this time, I didn't know anything, but I was convinced enough about what was going on to act. I explained to the children what was going on. Ariel appeared to comprehend, but Roger was not pleased. Both of the kids were delighted about school preparations, especially Roger, who had no idea I had already put everything up. Ariel was eager to leave as soon as possible and was overjoyed when I informed her she could drive Doreen's Volvo. She did not expect an automobile at all. I thought it was the fair thing to do. Roger was supposed to stay with my parents until arrangements could be arranged for him to travel to Harlingen. He'd probably still be here when Doreen got back from her trip. We'd just have to wait and see if it caused any issues. The kids could keep all of their personal items at my parents' house for as long as needed. I was unsure what I would be doing. Bobby and I arrived at the departure terminal at the same time. We didn't speak, but couldn't see each other from 50 feet apart. Cora and Doreen laughed and giggled as they entered the institution. They remembered to turn, wave, and grin at both of us before exiting the platform. Bobby and I did not exchange smiles when I got at work. I was met with a slew of government vehicles and a few police units. This was a circumstance I had encountered previously, so I just tightened my belt and strolled in. Gloria smiled as she waited for me. She has also witnessed this before. The work area was almost completely deserted. 
There were a few Haitians roaming around, but no Jamaicans or Dominicans were observed, including Malcolm James. Gloria had already contacted the lawyers. I spent the next 30 minutes talking nonsense to many government suits, but couldn't tell whether they were local, state, or federal. It didn't really matter. The legal beagles finally arrived, and Gloria and I were able to flee without incident. We were drinking coffee at Starbucks when Bobby called John. I just heard on the radio that the feds raided your home. What's happening? It, okay, Bobby, the firm is in complete control of everything. Gloria and I are currently having a hot cup. How about on your end? I took care of everything at work and in the bank. The boys and I will be packing the remainder of the day and leaving tomorrow morning. That sounds wonderful, brother. Do you need anything? We're fine, John. I also saw a lawyer. The divorce paperwork has been initiated. Sorry to hear it, but I believe we both knew it was coming. They plan to serve the papers the day she returns. I'll be long gone. I guess I'll have to pick them both up from the airport when they return home. I'll simply drop her off at the residence. Is this okay? That sounds fantastic to me. I'm guessing they've arrived already. They've all settled into their quarters. Are you sure you don't want to tell me what is going on? No way, brother. The less you know, the better. I do not think anything will happen till tomorrow. You can think about that as you drive down Route 81. I had just hung up the phone when I received a call from Pierce Donovan, our division leader and the man in charge of establishing the new operations. Gloria and I were summoned to the headquarters of the King of Prussia the next morning. Gloria appeared pleased with it, but I had some misgivings. I can't explain it because I actually enjoy my job. I made plans to pick up Gloria the next morning and drove home. Ariel had already packed her car for the trip. I really wanted to go with her, but she convinced me that she was capable of taking care of herself, under the conditions. I did not dispute with her. The majority of her belongings were in cardboard boxes in the garage, ready to be transported to my parents' home for storage. Roger was packing nearly all of his belongings for storage. The military academy would provide him with everything he needed. They were better for the money they were asking. Dad was going to drive him down to visit some old Air Force mates in San Antonio. Mom was resolute and begged to get out of that trip. I was proud of how the kids handled everything. They had a greater understanding of what they wanted to do than I did. I opted to stay with Mom while Dad traveled. That meant I had to do a lot of packing as well. We did not get a call from Doreen, and I had not expected one. She had carefully laid the groundwork by stating that she would only call if there was an issue. The kids and I went to CC's for pizza, and on the way home, we picked up a few bundles of boxes and some additional packing tape. It was two in the morning before I got everything organized and ready to go. Dad was coming over in the morning with his pickup to get everything. It would likely require at least three journeys. At the very least, it would keep the kids busy while I worked. The next firm activity would begin in Lancaster. The bigwigs were a little unhappy when I turned down this one. I did, however, recommend Gloria because she was as knowledgeable about running things as I was, and she was eager to advance as soon as we left the office. She was on the phone with her husband, relaying the wonderful news. It would nearly treble her income. She was a cheerful girl. I had no notion what I'd be doing. Bobby called me as I was on my way home. He and the boys were just entering Tennessee. He appeared happy. I felt pleased for him. The kids were staying with mom and dad, but I decided to stay one more night at home to tie up any loose ends. I was about to complete the evening when the phone rang. Ah, Mr. Ellison, it is good to see that you were home. Malcolm is my friend. Where in the hell are you? I am at home, of course, taking care of business as you requested. And do you have international calling on your cell phone? Of course, everyone here does. I presume you have some good news for me. There was a statement presented as a question. Most certainly, sir. In fact, everything went much easier than I had expected. You can rest assured that all of your issues have been resolved. Thanks. You. You are a true friend, Mr. Ellison. I only did what you had paid me to do. Why do I think it's more than that? Take care, Mr. Ellison. You don't want to fall into that trap. We both laughed for no apparent reason. Mr. Ellison? I was sorry to hear about your problems at work. I hope you've survived any consequences. I'm fine. I'm also curious about how you got all of your people out of the way. Mr. Ellison, I have friends in the INS I suppose I should have let you know. But I decided against it. I was able to care for all of my people. However, some Haitians had a stubborn streak. 
I think everything turned out well. So what are your plans now? I think I'll take a short break until I can resolve a few personal issues. Mr. Ellison, please remember this number and keep in touch. I believe I have something that you would be interested in. That'd be nice. I intend to do that. I still have two more beers to finish before getting some sleep. It would be three more days before Doreen and Cora returned from their vacation. After the first day, I found myself doing redundant tasks. I did consult a lawyer, Glenn Roast, to determine what my obligations would be if I filed for divorce. There wasn't enough money left to set up an offshore account or anything. I decided not to turn off the utilities. I was simply not going to pay for anything anymore. My credit score would suffer significantly, but I was confident I could handle it. The next morning, Ariel drove to North Carolina in her new Volvo. Her summer session would start in 10 days. Mom and Dad gave her a small nest egg to help her settle in. Roger and Dad decide to take off the same day Doreen returns. Roger preferred to avoid any unpleasant confrontations. I thought it was a good idea. They appeared to have several stops planned along the way, including some Memphis barbecue and New Orleans gumbo. Everyone seemed to be happy except me. I was trying desperately not to wallow in my misery. The only thing that seemed to work was beer. Later that night, I received another call from Malcolm. Unfortunately, it was on my cell phone. Mr. Ellison, is there anything happening on your end? What do you mean? The gentleman in question has been missing for two days and the ladies have not notified hotel staff or the local police. Did they possibly report it to your local authorities? Not that I know of. Why haven't they contacted local officials? My people tell me that they seem to be baffled or confused about what to do. They're definitely not having a good time. My guess is that they are afraid of drawing attention to the situation and exposing themselves. I'm not sure what term to use, Mr. Ellison. I do not want to offend you in any way, so they're doing nothing. They appear to be constantly waiting for the gentleman to arrive and expecting that things will resolve themselves. I'm afraid they will be quite dissatisfied. Mr. James, what do you propose I do? As far as I can see, you have no recourse. We have to wait for them to determine whether to report it here or in the States. When they return, this would be awkward. What local authority would they contact to report a crime that occurred in Jamaica? Mr. Ellison, I believe you have created a predicament for your wife. I have a feeling she regrets she hadn't taken this trip, regardless of what she does. She'll be in trouble. Thank you for the call. Mr. James, I'm going to sleep with a smile on my face tonight. I'll call you if anything changes. Mr. Ellison, morning. Caused a lot of anxiety. I didn't sleep as well as I expected. The first thing I did was contact Bobby and ask whether he had heard from Cora. He hadn't heard from his wife either. He and the lads had a good journey and were all settled in nicely. Before hanging up, Bobby stated that he would be shutting off his cell phone for the next two weeks. He told me to phone Grant's number if I needed to contact him. It was the longest day of my life. I double-checked the house to ensure that everything had been taken care of. I wanted to see the lawyer again and fill out an information form so that I could file for divorce without issue at the appropriate time. I handed him power of attorney to handle the separation and any other matters for me on a whim. I provided him a large retainer to cover any potential future consequences from the Jamaica incident. I was worried that I'd gone too far on the way back to my parents' home. I recognized that none of my issues were related to my marriage. Sure, everything I had done was due to Dorian's adultery, but the breakup didn't seem to hurt me. I had eventually decided to accept it. That revelation brought a sense of serenity. Knowing that the children would not be subjected to any significant trauma made things much easier. I'm not sure why I didn't feel worse. I felt betrayed and not humiliated. That was surprising because it wasn't what I had expected. Roger and Dad departed with the rising sun. Roger got to drive the first leg of the journey. Mom insisted on preparing lunch for them, although I suspect they were looking forward to a week or two of junk food. I had roughly six hours to kill before the jet returned from Jamaica. I got to spend some rare one-on-one -on -one time with my mother. She was supportive, but just to be on the safe side. She said nothing against Doreen. They had really gotten along very well throughout the years, and I believe Mom was disappointed to discover what had happened. I didn't stop the car and go inside to assist them. I simply waited for them to go out of the terminal with their backs to me. I had to relocate the car twice, but just circled and returned. 
Why didn't you step in and help us get our backs? Parking the automobile is a headache, and I figured it would be easier all around. John, where's Bobby? Cora realized that her husband hadn't arrived and felt forced to inquire. He and the guys are chained together. I told him I'd drop you off at the house. In a few minutes, we were on our way. No one spoke for the first few miles. The silence was fairly noticeable. Doreen appeared to be preoccupied, staring out the side window, while Cora sat in the back, trying not to draw attention. So, are you going to tell me about the trip? What you did and where you went? Did you have any decent food? You two are unusually calm for recently coming from a tropical vacation. The flight was long, John, to tell the truth. We're exhausted. I only want a hot shower and a soft bed, that is it. That is all you can say for five days. I will tell you all about it tomorrow. Okay. She didn't notice me smiling to myself because she was looking out the window again. The remainder of the ride home was silent. It would have been simple to push the envelope a little, but I was having enough pleasure simply seeing them squirm. Because I had not heard from Malcolm, I assumed that they had not reported the missing guys to anyone. I wonder what they did with their luggage. Interesting. I dropped Cor off at their house and arrived into our driveway ten minutes later. Doreen gave me a weird look when I took her luggage out of the car and laid them on the grass rather than carrying them into the house. As I was getting back into the car, she finally spoke out. John, where are you going? Are you not coming into the house? How about my bags? I need to flee right now, sweetie. I will call you later. She seemed perplexed as she stood there watching me drive away. I would have loved to see her expression when she realized I had actually moved out of the house. Of course, she wouldn't have much time to think about it as Cora was undoubtedly on the phone by now. John Dorian has already called three times. She keeps asking me what's going on and I try not to answer her. John, you know, I'm not good at that kind of stuff. I don't like what happened and I don't want to be in the middle of it. You were going to have to speak to her. Sorry, Mom. The next time she calls, I'll answer. Did she ask about the children at all? No, she was talking about an empty house and a problem Cora appeared to be experiencing. I didn't try to explain. I simply put her off. I took a drink from the fridge and settled into the easy chair by the phone. It was barely five minutes till the next call. John, what the hell is going on? Could you be more specific? What are you doing at your folks' house? Where are the children? I'd appreciate some responses. What the hell is wrong? Ariel left for school. She wanted to settle in so she could attend a couple summer sessions. Everything's fine. You do not need to worry about her. Why couldn't she have waited until I returned? What was the hurry? I don't know. I assume she was nervous. All of Roger. Things are gone. Where is he now? Dad and Roger are on the way to Texas. He will finally be able to attend one of the military colleges he has been pestering us about. He will be gone for at least five years. He put all of his belongings in storage just like Ariel. Why didn't you talk about this with me? I am also their parent. You completely cut me out of everything. That's not fair. Yeah, I understand. Life is terrible. What does this mean? You have no cause to be sarcastic. What the hell are you doing at your folks' house? Did you go out to bingo? Jackpot. Did you figure it out? Yes, I've moved out. You have the house to yourself. There was no immediate response. I'm not sure how long the silence lasted, but it seemed like minutes. I patiently waited for her. Cora yelled out her next move. She stated Bobby and the twins had left. He left a note stating that they traveled to Alaska. Do you know anything about it, John? Yes, he told me a little something. Bobby had claimed that divorce papers would be served on his wife, but Doreen had not mentioned them. I could only presume that it hadn't been completed yet. John, what brought all of this about? Tell me something. I try to remain out of Bobby's life, Doreen. All I know is that he referenced someone named Calvin Bostick. Do you know anything about him? This time, the hush was much longer. I waited for any kind of reaction. I'm sure she was thinking that if Bobby knew about Calvin, I should know about Addison. John. I'm not feeling very good right now. I am tired and perplexed. I need to get some rest and think things through. Can you stop by the house tomorrow? Sure, sweetie. I've got plenty of time. By the way, I believe you should know that I have also lost my job. I'm now officially unemployed. A few seconds later, the phone died. My mother wasn't pleased. I was in no hurry to confront Doreen. I arrived at the house at 10 a.m. It would have to be finished eventually. Cora was there. John, we understand what you did. It appeared like Doreen would be the designated spokesperson. 
Could you please clarify this to me? Do not be a smart ass. It does not suit you. I choose not to respond to that. Cora approached Will Curry. You and Bobby were aware of Calvin and Addison's situation. Okay, told Bobby everything. And Bobby told you. You cannot refute it. You can't hide it. So who is this guy? Addison. How come you've never mentioned him to me? John, you were trying to be cute again. You are well aware of Addison's identity. You also knew Calvin and Addison were traveling to Jamaica with Katrina. Everything she said was correct, so I saw no reason to fight with her. Neither of you attempted to stop us from traveling on that vacation. You were both aware that we were heading to a tropical island with two men, and you did nothing to stop it. What type of husbands react like that? It seemed as if you didn't care. Things were getting funnier. Now. Doreen was skillfully shifting the blame for the affair from the unfaithful spouses to the uninterested husbands. She caught me smiling and her tone quickly changed. It's not humorous. You're a whole. You are responsible for the deaths of two good guys. You could have said something. You could have stopped it. But no, you had to go get them killed. You did not do it yourself. But we know you organized it. Did you report this? What do you mean? When did you realize they were killed? Who have you notified? No one. We couldn't tell anyone. If we had, you and Bobby would have learned what we had done. We couldn't take that chance. So you left Jamaica without alerting the authorities that the two men you were with had been killed? I think someone is going to be upset. Both women simply sat and stared at me. I was still smiling. So, my lovely wife, what are you planning to do now? We're going to the police station to report it. It needs to be done. And pray. Tell me how the local police will handle a murder that occurred in Jamaica. Do they have the bodies or the murder weapons? There are no bodies. You were too intelligent for it, weren't you? I'm not sure what I ever did to deserve this, Doreen. But you go to the cops and tell them everything. Make sure the report explains why the four of you went to Jamaica and what you intended to do there. I will need the information for the divorce proceedings. You. My comment sparked a response from the entire court. Bobby had me served papers last night. You knew that, right? You were chuckling to yourself on the drive home from the airport, right? Yeah, he did mention something like that before leaving. I watched Cora storm out of the room. I couldn't tell if she was crying or simply very angry. I stood up and approached the door. John, I am sorry. It was not supposed to turn out this way. Doreen's voice softened. How were things intended to turn out? I waited for a few moments and received no response. Doreen, could you at least explain why you did this? I waited a few moments as she collected her thoughts. Your children had grown up and you were constantly working. My life had become dull and uninteresting. Cora had experienced the same issue and stated that she resolved it by establishing a few male friends outside of the home. A few male friends? Do not interrupt, John. Otherwise, I will not be able to finish this. I figured it was worth taking a chance, so I had her set me up with Addison. So, was it worthwhile? I observed her fidget slightly before responding, Actually, John, yes, it was worthwhile. Everything was nice and fun. I cannot lie to you. I adored every moment until I met Addison. You were the only guy I'd ever been with. I would never leave you to be with him. But I always had a nice time while we were together, so I was only a big joke. It was not like that, John. I wasn't attempting to replace you or make fun of you. I was simply seeking to make my life more interesting. I didn't need to hear any more. I turned and walked out the door. I went to Wendy's for lunch. Detective Daniel Green came to see me shortly before noon the next day. He let me drive my own car to the station. I believe he did this so that he would not have to drive me back. He didn't seem too bothered about my arrival. We talked for three hours. I finally contacted Glenn Ross. He resolved everything so that I could depart. He also received copies of Doreen's statement regarding the alleged murder. Her certified statements about the purpose for the vacation were going to be sufficient for the divorce papers. Detective Green appeared baffled. He stated that he would need to contact the Montego Bay police and Jamaican authorities before deciding on any line of action. I am very unfamiliar with all of the phrases used to describe the many levels of murder and the evidence required for each. He was attempting to explain everything to me, but I shut it out late that night. I received another call from Malcolm James. It was short, very short. Tomorrow, Mr. Ellison.
Tomorrow will be a wonderful day. Tomorrow came and nothing happened until around 2 p.m. I received a call from Detective Green. He was sort of giggling as he spoke, which made me uncomfortable. This evening, Mr. Ellison watched the local news at 5 p.m. and the national news at 6 o'clock. I think you'll find it interesting. It was a brief news report, but as Detective Green stated, fascinating local males were seen roaming naked down a dirt road in the hills about 60 miles south of Montego Bay, Jamaica. The men claimed to have been kidnapped and held for ransom at a goat farm in the mountains. They escaped early this morning and made their way to town, where they were rescued. The national news was almost identical, with the exception of images of the two guys and their identities. I received another call from Detective Green shortly afterwards. He asked me to come in the next morning so we could talk about the incident. I thought that was very generous of him. Mom thought the entire thing was hilarious, and I believe she even winked at me. I had a good night's sleep before entering Detective Green's office. I saw Doreen and Cora being led into the same interrogation room where I had previously been. I am confident they were going to have a great time the rest of the day. Mr. Ellison, I'm not sure you were absolutely innocent in this affair, but I now understand your role from a very different perspective. He was truly smiling when he said that, and I couldn't help but return the smile. As I have stated, I am absolutely innocent of anything related to the disappearance of those two men. I expected him to laugh, but instead, he handed me a cup of coffee. Mr. Ellison, it appears that Mr. Bostick and Mr. Everly left their holiday compound at midnight to buy a small amount of local cannabis known as ganja. They were kidnapped five minutes after leaving the hotel, tied up and driven for an hour over rugged mountain roads. Do you understand that this is their version? I sipped the hot coffee brought into the office by one of the uniformed officers and smiled, nodding slightly. Both males were stripped naked and imprisoned inside a goat pin, a goat pin with door and window bars. The next morning, they were informed that the females who had accompanied them to the hotel had received a ransom demand of $10,000 USD apiece. They wouldn't be released until the ransom was paid. Detective Green paused for a moment, tasting some of the machine coffee. It sucked but he seemed accustomed to it. Detective Green, I do not believe my wife or sister-in-law had access to that type of money. Apparently not. The next day, Mr. Bostick and Mr. Eberly were informed that the ransom demand had been reduced to $5,000 apiece and that this had been delivered to both Mrs. Ellis since the coffee was tasting slightly better by this point. The following day, the price was $1,000 apiece and by the time the ladies left to return home, the price had been reduced to $1,000 for both males. I can only presume the ransom was not paid. It gets better than that, Mr. Ellison. Much better. He motioned softly to ask if I wanted more coffee, which I denied. Since the ransom had not been paid, the men overheard their captors discussing that night. The kidnappers determined that they would have to kill both of them in the morning. Fortunately, they noticed that one of the hut's windows was unlocked. At that point, I found it impossible to control myself, and so did my host. We managed to confine it to hushed snickers and heroic efforts. They broke free from their captivity and dashed down the mountain without shoes or clothing. I swear that if the situation hadn't been so terrible, both of us would have laughed. We paused for a moment before he resumed. Mr. Ellison, your wife and sister-in-law never received a ransom demand. Now, isn't that amazing? Is this a question or a comment? Now, both of us were laughing gently so as not to draw notice. Seriously, Mr. Ellison, I am sure you had some say in this whole mess. However, I see no need for us to pursue anything at this time. That's good news. Can I consider this situation closed? Or should I expect for something to come up in the future? From my perspective, it is closed. However, your wife and sister-in-law have a few more questions concerning the claims brought against you and your brother. Our legal team is carefully evaluating their statements, just in case Doreen and Cora were still inside the interrogation room. As I walked out of the building, my wife noticed me and attempted to make a gesture. I pretended I didn't notice her and continued walking. The local newspaper ran a front-page piece about Doreen and Cora, and they were both featured by name. I am sure they will receive a lot of questions about it from all of our friends and family. I stopped at Taco Bell for lunch on my way home. That evening, I received another call from Malcolm. Mr. Ellison, how are things at your end? It couldn't be better, my friend. I am extremely impressed. Thank you.
Mr. Ellison, I always do my best. I indicated a few days ago that there may be a position here that is suitable for you. Do you think you may be interested? I'd be interested in discussing it. Fine. Your ticket will be waiting for you at the Jamaica Airlines counter tomorrow morning. Do not worry. This will be a round-trip ticket. Malcolm was chuckling at the other end. A devilish tiny laugh. Six weeks later, I had entirely migrated to Falmouth, Jamaica. Malcolm James appears to have a large network of acquaintances with a lot of money to invest. They purchased an all-inclusive resort facility that had fallen on hard times because 90% of the clients were from North America or Europe. They needed a man of my stature to be the responsible person in charge. Yes, I have sold out. I was now in the position of acting as a front or shill, so to speak. Despite the fact that I was responsible for setting up and managing the facility, I reported to a covert group that wanted to avoid any and all publicity. I was generously paid and compensated. It was an unusual role. I worked with a lady named Maria, who was wanted by Finnish authorities for the murder of her philandering husband. As long as she remained in Jamaica, she was safe. She was in charge of all recreational activities, events, and advertising. The majority of the other employees were locals who, for some reason, appeared to have impeccable work ethics. Many of them, I realized, had been hired by Malcolm James. Interesting. The building had three separate restaurants, and goat was a key menu item in each of them. Doreen and Cora had been convicted of something linked to the incident, and they were both given suspended sentences. I never even learned what the specific allegations were. Calvin Bostick and Addison Eberly both accused Doreen and Cora of refusing to pay the ransom. They never trusted the claim that no ransom demands had ever been made. I believe those relationships faded rather quickly, five months after moving. My divorce was final. When you're having fun, time seems to fly by. Two years have passed. Ariel is doing well at Duke, and Roger is currently attending Texas A&M on a full scholarship. Doreen communicates with them three or four times per month by cell phone. Cora hunted Bobby down in Tennessee and had him served with paperwork in order to gain custody of the twin children. A week later, Bobby and the lads arrived in Alaska. Maria and I have moved in together. There is an unusual thrill in sleeping with a lady who murdered her spouse, similar to bungee leaping. I had no additional communication with Doreen until last week. Mr. Ellison, I have good and bad news. Malcolm has become a big joker. I constantly need to be on my toes. Tell me the bad news first. The Silver Star cruise ship docked this morning and your wife is aboard with a guy friend. The cold ran up my spine. What's good news? He gave a wide grin, large enough to display the evil gold tooth. Her name was on a specific list maintained by the Jamaican authorities. Because we are now using passports for all Caribbean travel, it was simple to identify her arrival. So what precisely does this mean? The former Mrs. Ellison has been jailed, and charges are being drafted. It appears that her failure to disclose the kidnapping three years ago was deemed a criminal violation of some kind. Many local leaders were embarrassed by the incident, and they were anxious for some retribution. Damn, Malcolm, she didn't accomplish anything. I know it, and so do you, but this does not make it go away. What is her travel companion doing to assist her? Nothing. When the police told him what had happened, he couldn't wait to get back aboard the ship. I believe he is intending to fly home. Dorian wound herself in Kingston, where she was accused with various petty infractions. There are no suspended sentences here. Some low-level U.S. Embassy personnel attempted to interfere, but to no avail. She was transferred to Fort Augusta for a year. It wasn't fair, yet it seemed out of my control. It took me three months to muster the confidence to go meet her. Malcolm had prearranged the visit. John, what are you doing here? It's very lovely to see you. How did you learn about this? She appeared leaner and haggard. Perhaps it was a lack of cosmetics and grooming. Doreen, I now live on the north side of the island. I've known about your condition for a long... What? Why didn't you do anything? You must know somebody here who can assist me. What do you want me to do? Get me out of here, please. You cannot imagine what this is like. I gazed at her but didn't say anything. I really didn't know what to say. John, the guards are pushing me to do favors for them. Favors? Sexual favors? John, I'm being forced or pressured into doing sexual favors to the male guards. Do I need to be more explicit? No, I believe I understand. I will see what I can do. 
We spent the next 30 minutes discussing the students and what they were doing. When I left, I promised her that I would see what I could do to aid her. I understand that it doesn't all make sense. I should be glad to see the witches being burned. But she was my wife of 20 years and the mother of my children. I described the issue to Malcolm. He seemed perplexed by my concern for Doreen's well-being, but vowed to take care of matters as if by magic. Doreen became off-limits to the guards, with no repercussions. I never checked it, but Malcolm's word was good enough. The processes began to shift, sentenced for time served. Two months later, I drove down to Kingston on the day she was discharged and supposed to return home as usual. Some low-level embassy personnel claimed credit for having her sentence mitigated. But I knew better. I didn't get to speak to her. But we saw each other from a distance. As she strolled across the tarmac, she smiled slightly and wore a powder blue pregnancy dress. I never saw her again. Never aimed to do so. If the first story does not satisfy you, please listen to the next story. Polly sat alone at the kitchen table, her gaze focused on the empty coffee cup in front of her. She dreaded the next conversation with her spouse Buddy, which was scheduled for today. Fortunately, their children were away at the neighbors for a sleepover, saving them from the inevitable yelling fight that lied ahead. Polly couldn't shake the sense of shame that hung heavy on her shoulders as she reflected on how a little innocent flirting and casual lunches had spun out of control. For more than a month, she had a feeling something was off. But it wasn't until she saw the most recent test results that she realized she needed to tell Fred the truth while she waited for him to return from his early morning errand to the supermarket. Polly was surprised when the doorbell rang and a massive truck pulled into the driveway, leaving her unprepared for any visitors. She figured it was just someone lost and looking for directions. May I assist you? Polly greeted and opened the door for the unexpected visitor. Are you Polly Brown? The man inquired. Yes, I'm Polly Brown. How can I serve you? She repeated, bewildered. I have a work order to pack up your possessions and transport them to 815 Southwest 10th Avenue the man informed her, waving a clipboard before Polly and signaling for his workers to begin unloading boxes from the truck. There must be an error. Polly protested and handed back the documents. I never initiated such an order, miss, and I understand. But Mr. Friend Brown placed the order a week ago, he explained, pointing to his signature at the bottom of the page. My husband will be back soon, and I am confident he will be able to rectify this misunderstanding. Polly insisted, Mrs. Brown, I just left your husband 20 minutes ago, and he told me to give you this envelope if you caused any trouble, he stated, giving Polly a huge man envelope. If you don't mind, could you help point us to the main bedroom? We only have one hour to finish things up, he requested. Polly opened the envelope and spoke softly as she looked at the single sheet of paper. She directed the workmen to the first apartment at the top of the stairs on the right. The men dashed upstairs, and for the next 40 minutes they worked hard, packing and dragging box after box to the truck sitting in the driveway. They tried to ask Polly questions every now and again, but she appeared to be distracted, so they did their best. Within 15 minutes, they announced their completed and readiness to leave. I will need your signature, Mrs. Brown, the lead worker requested. Polly frantically wrote something at the bottom of the paper, and they quickly outperformed. Polly's father came exactly ten minutes later. Darling, Harry remarked, seeing his daughter's astonished gaze. Friend asked me to pick you up because he thought you might not be able to drive, he said. Your mother is waiting for us, and the movers are preparing to deliver your goods. We'll keep everything in the garage for now and sort it out later, Harry informed Polly as he led her out of the house. This cannot be happening, Polly mumbled loudly as Harry helped her get into the car. Where is Fred? If friend were here, he could sort out the whole situation. She pondered quietly. He listened. Wendy. Half an hour later, the friend returned to the residence, escorted by a locksmith. Change all of the locks, including the code for the garage door opener. He guided the locksmith. Leave me five sets of keys and make sure the side garage door has a deadbolt, he instructed, entering the now vacant house, ascending the steps. Friend discovered that the workers had done an admirable job given the short schedule he had imposed. Glancing at his watch, he knew he only had 15 minutes till the next truck arrived, so he grabbed a couple of empty cartons. He finished packing the remaining items that the movers had overlooked, including Polly's makeup and amenities from their bathroom. Vanity, carrying down the final two boxes. 
He noticed the coming of the following truck. Friend welcomed his sister Melissa when she arrived with the movers. Hey there, he replied, drawing her into a hug. Why don't you take the second bedroom to the left near to the bathroom? He mentioned that it's much bigger than the extra room and includes a walk-in closet. We can deal with the kids' issues later. Sure thing. How about Polly's car? Melissa inquired. Her father is due to pick it up later tonight. Fred informed her that he had finished with the movers. Could you handle things here for a while? I need to stop by the office for a minute. I'll get pizza for tonight, he added. I'm heading towards the garage. No mushrooms. Melissa called after him and then turned to instruct the movers on where to store things. Right on time, Fred noted, checking his watch from his automobile. Friend witnessed his three best friends having a furious argument with Simon, a co-worker of his wife who did not appear happy. After about five minutes, Mike, one of the three males, approached his companion's parked car. He assumed we were joking until I pulled out my knife, Mike said with a smile. I gave him two choices. Leave within 24 hours or face an unexpected incident with the knife. We told him we'd come by tomorrow to hear his choice. He finished with amusement as seen by his tone. How are you holding up, buddy? I'll be better tomorrow, Fred said somberly. I never envisioned having to cope with something like this but I'll get through it. He thanked Mike and said that he needed to leave, but would follow up with him later at the house to collect up the copies of images and receipts that the investigator had left off at his office on Friday afternoon. Fred recognized their contents without having to open them. They were for his lawyer's reference. Well, there goes a grant, he grumbled as he looked at the invoice after dropping the packet off at his lawyer's office. Friend Grant's pizzas, a case of beer, and his ride home tonight begged for complete indulgence. As a single father, he will need to set a fresh example, certainly not like the one his soon-to-be ex-wife had set when he returned. The moving truck had left, and Melissa and a few pals were busy preparing her bedroom. Hello, dude. She met a friend as he climbed the stairs. Where is all that muscle you promised me? She quipped. They're finishing up stuff for me, but they'll be here in about an hour. Why don't we take a break and grab something to eat? Friend suggested Melissa and her friends. Mike and his pals arrived shortly before four o'clock. By seven o'clock, everyone had gathered to enjoy a few drinks and informal talk. Everyone except pal Melissa ultimately discovered him in the den, immersed in old home movies. We have everything upstairs in my room and everyone has finished eating. Is there anything I can get you? She asked. Not right now, honey, but thank you for asking. Friends answered. I just need some time alone. Well, I'll be in the kitchen if you need something, Melissa reassured him, kissing the top of his head before closing the door. I never saw it coming, friend muttered to himself. How could I have been so blind? Just over a month ago, while paying bills online, friends discovered a charge for a checkup at the local clinic. Honorable. Did you visit the doctor a week ago? He yelled out to his wife, who was in the kitchen making dinner. I believed I had the flu and went in for a B12 injection she yelled back. Ridiculous rates, he murmured to himself as he studied the bill. Even with insurance, a routine physical and a vitamin B12 shot cost $1.125. I will call them tomorrow. Maybe there's a mistake, he considered. Deep down, he knew there wasn't. The next day, Fred called the clinic's billing department from his office. Good morning. How may I serve you? The receptionist responded. Good morning. My wife, Polly Brown, went to your clinic two weeks ago, and I believe we were overcharged. He said that she merely received a basic exam and a B12 shot, yet we were charged $125 when it should have been no more than $45 after insurance. After a little delay, the receptionist spoke again. Polly Brown, you said it, she confirmed. Yes, that is right, Fred responded, sir. In addition to the B12 shot, your wife received blood work and other tests. She informed him about blood work and testing. What kind of tests? Fred inquired, his displeasure increasing. I'm sorry, sir, but we can't share that information, she replied. Listen, Polly is my wife, and I am not asking for the outcomes. French, clearly frustrated, asked what kind of tests were undertaken. As her spouse, she had a full blood count and a pregnancy test. The receptionist disclosed. Thank you for this information. I will go ahead and pay the bill, Fred responded curtly ending the call. Can you say heart attack? Why on earth was Polly taking a pregnancy test, especially after Fred had a vasectomy shortly after their second child? 
It didn't took a genius to figure out what was going on. Polly had always struggled with various forms of birth control and was vehemently opposed to abortion, frequently claiming that it was murder regardless of how you looked at it. Following the slip that resulted in their second daughter, a friend decided to have a vasectomy, believing it would prevent any additional surprises and end the abortion discussion once and for all. Or so he thought. Ten minutes later, Fred was sitting at his desk, leafing through the yellow pages in search of a private investigator. Until then, he'd never questioned Polly's loyalty. But now, doubt nodded to him. Friend had not expected the cost of having his wife's identity known. She must be involved with someone at work. He confided in the private investigator. She consistently returns home at the same hour, and except for infrequent team-building seminars, she is constantly at work. I need you to start immediately since I am going mad not knowing whether she has been unfaithful, and I, Dan, will need to know who. His next call went to Ben, a good friend who worked in Polly's division. Ben Friend Brown. Here he began. I'm sorry to ask, but I need to speak with you outside of work if possible. Can women and Mo interact after hours? Great. See you around 530. He arranged. Friend wasn't sure how to approach Ben about the matter, but she believed honesty would be the most effective way given their long history of friendship. As they sipped on Bud Lights, a friend brought up the uncomfortable topic. Ben, I recently found out Polly is cheating on me, and I suspected someone at her employment, he confided. It appears to have been going on for a few months, and I need to identify the person. Ben was taken aback, knowing that Fred Polly would never do that to you. There must be a misunderstanding. No misunderstandings, Ben. I have evidence. I just want to know who it is, Fred insisted. Fred, our company isn't that huge, and I know the majority of the employees by their first names, Ben reassured him. Sure, there's the standard office chatter, but that's it. However, I have two co-workers with me. Big favors, and they'll be aware of any irregularities. Trust me, I'll contact you if I find anything. I'm sorry about Polly, he said truly. Not more than I am, Fred replied gently. The following three days were excruciating. Fred struggled with the want to face Polly and demand explanations. But at this point, it appeared futile. Their sex life, while not exceptional, was satisfactory. They made love approximately twice a week, which appeared appropriate given their parental duties. Polly, on the other hand, had exhibited no desire to try new things in bed, and she continued to decline Fred's requests for specific intimate actions. Nothing had altered in that respect. When Polly returned from her monthly seminars, one detail stood out to her friends. They never got intimate that night. Perhaps it was just a coincidence, but my friend couldn't stop himself from looking for oddities in every aspect. These seminars were often held on Friday afternoons at the Best Western and lasted approximately two hours, followed by a casual gathering for happy hour and food. Fred would take his kids out to supper or see his parents on certain occasions, making sure they didn't get home until after 8 p.m. He found himself doubting every facet of his marriage, urgently seeking an explanation for Polly's infidelity. On Friday morning, Ben called to provide an update. If she is in a relationship at work, it is most likely with a new guy named Simon Turner. He joined last year, and there are rumors that they had lunch together several times and were seen dancing at happy hour. He informed Fred. I understand that isn't hard evidence, but it's the best lead I could uncover. I hope you two can work it out. Thank you for the information, but I'm not holding out much hope, Fred responded somberly. He forwarded the material to the private investigator Ben had recommended, then closed up shop and went home. How was he meant to play the role of a normal loving spouse when all he wanted to do was toss Polly out and try to rebuild his broken life? The weekend was filled with regular family activities. On Sunday, we'll do yard maintenance, soccer practice, and have a neighborhood cookout. Despite Polly's attempts to begin intimacy on Saturday night, Fred made an excuse about an upset stomach and turned away, pretending to sleep. Thankfully, Monday arrived, providing Fred with a break from the chaos of homework, allowing him to find a location to focus and put his plans into action. The final piece of the jigsaw was starting the divorce process. He had already hired a lawyer and paid the retainer, as he lived in a no-fault state and they were both employed. Fred wanted a fair 50-50 split with no spousal support. One non-negotiable demand was for custody of their two girls. Polly's betrayal was massive, and he must have agreed to his requirements. 
he threatened to reveal her infidelity to everyone she knew. Anticipating Polly's reaction, Fran secured a restraining order that barred her from approaching the house within 250 feet, though she could still call the girls. By Tuesday, the private investigator had discovered damning evidence. Two Best Weston motel room receipts recorded in Simon's name. Surveillance photographs from Friday summer nights showed Polly and Simon entering the room together, capturing them, and kissing in the hallway. Friend denied to view the incriminating photographs, asking the investigator to place everything in a manila envelope and deliver it to his office. He expressed gratitude for the quick service and stated that payment will be provided soon. By the end of the exciting week, all arrangements had been completed. The kids had sleepovers booked for Friday and Saturday evenings. Both sets of movers were booked. The locksmith was scheduled to arrive at 2 o'clock, and the paperwork would be filed on Monday and served on Tuesday afternoon. Polly has no idea what's about to happen, her pal remarked. Polly's story, seated at the kitchen table and engrossed in self-pity, was told in order to keep the element of surprise. I was taken aback when the movers appeared at the door. I told them to wait until Fred returned, but the moment he handed me the letter, my heart fell. With a sickening feeling, I realized Fred was aware of everything. It included a copy of the pregnancy test I'd taken at the clinic. Initially, I dismissed my symptoms as influenza, a typical illness at the time. However, as days passed and the illness persisted without the regular body aches, an uneasy thought entered my head. Carol made a light-hearted comment one morning. It sounds like you are pregnant again. Polly, you put a seed of possibility in my imagination. Simon's arrival coincided with my 30th birthday, which made me feel like an elderly married woman. I helped with his training and found him to be friendly, perfectly focused, and pretty attractive despite our five-year age difference. We had comparable musical choices and a common appreciation of Mexican cuisine. Our relationships grew as we started gathering for lunch at the neighborhood Mexican restaurant and going out for drinks after our monthly seminars. The music pulled us to the dance floor on a Friday evening at a team-building event. We swayed through two fast-paced songs until the calm melody started. I hadn't done a slow dance with anyone since I married. It was Simon. It felt natural as we glided across the floor. A flood of warmth washed over me, and I found peace in his arms. We reluctantly returned to the group after the song, but the recollection persisted. The evening grew warmer as we drank a few more cocktails. I soon found myself on the road heading home. The memory of the dance and the evident connection lingers in my mind. I knew I should have terminated it, but the time spent with Simon was too good to pass up. Dancing and a few lunches appeared innocent enough, or so I convinced myself. It wasn't until the fourth Friday meeting that everything returned. Our department earned an honor for being the best producers. Each of us received a dollar one hundred bonus. We chose to celebrate at the bar, and after a few hours, just four of us remained. I had overindulged and realized I needed coffee before driving home. Simon offered to accompany me to the restaurant. I stumbled on a carpet, and Simon caught me before I hit the ground, holding my waist and chest while he helped me stand up. He inquired, Are you okay? I kissed him on impulse. It took him off surprise, but he answered very immediately. After what seemed like a lifetime, I pulled back, blushing with embarrassment. I'm so sorry. I should not have done that. I stammered, humiliated. Please forgive me. Don't worry about it, Polly, Simon reassured me with a chuckle. Consider expressing your gratitude for saving your life. Let's get some coffee into you, he recommended, leading me to the eatery the next week. I kept as much distance from Simon as possible. I planned to be busy during noon and avoided stopping by for happy hour the following Friday. It had been a dreadful mistake, and I couldn't get over my want to be in Simon's arms. Despite her resolution two weeks later, Polly found herself back at happy hour with a companion who was not anticipated to return until 830. She planned to have dinner and drinks with a few of her colleagues. Strangely, everyone appeared to have an excuse to go early, until just Polly and Simon remained by 630. Shall we get anything to eat? Simon recommended to Polly as the music started playing. Polly seizes the chance and invites Simon to dance. To her astonishment, the evening progressed rapidly. They danced to each of the songs as they were played in order. Polly felt her heart pound against her chest. 
finding comfort in Simon's arms. Before she knew it, they were in the back seat of Simon's car, engaging in everything except intercourse. Time passed, and it was nearly eight o'clock when they recognized and straightened her clothes and hair. Polly gave Simon one last kiss before departing to her car. Despite the enormity of her acts, Polly felt no shame. The weight of her shame only became apparent once she rejoined with her husband and children. That night, a buddy wanted her, but Polly couldn't bear to meet his look, let alone participate in intimacy. After a long shower, she slipped into bed, finding solace in her friend's arms for the rest of the night. Polly, despite being aware of the danger she was putting herself in, could not resist the pull of her unlawful relationship. They started sneaking around during lunch breaks, and the thrill of secret heightened the intensity of their interactions. A week later, Simon disclosed that he had reserved a hotel for Friday night at the Best Western in preparation of their meeting. We parted ways at the bar and agreed to reunite in the hotel corridor. Are you certain about this? Simon inquired, his voice tinted with doubt. I'm not sure, but let's not stay in the corridor. Polly responded with urgency. Within moments of entering the room, the inhibition was broken, and they found themselves ripping off each other's garments in a fit of want. Polly got home 45 minutes before friend and the kids were scheduled to return. They met twice more until Polly became ill, which she attributed to the flu. Carol indicated that she might be pregnant. Polly panicked and raced to the doctor. She couldn't believe the findings indicated pregnancy at all. Simon always used protection, and friend got a vasectomy. She gazed at the test findings. Polly recognized she was in a bad situation, stuck in more ways than one, sitting alone in the kitchen. She waited. Friends return, knowing she must break the news to him. Little did she know that her world was about to implode. The end of marriage acquaintance sought retaliation from both Polly and Simon. He requested Simon leave town and never return, so he wouldn't have to see him again. Friend had a strong desire to see Polly suffer for breaking up their once happy family, with his single sister Melissa coming in to help him raise their two girls. Friend faced the huge job of navigating the nuances of female puberty with no idea where to begin. Despite the hardships ahead, Fred found strength in his parents' unflinching support, knowing that they would weather the storm together. On Sunday, Fred gathered his daughters and Melissa to gently explain the conflict between him and their mother. He told them that they could still see their mother whenever they wanted, even if she wouldn't be living with them any longer. Tears were shed, but a bowl of ice cream helped them feel better. By Tuesday, Polly had been served with divorce papers. Despite her constant attempts to reach out, Fred maintained his silence. Melissa's attempts to express the gravity of the situation fell on deaf ears. Fred acted decisively, dissolving all joint financial arrangements and removed Polly from his insurance 401. There are additional accounts. Friend did, however, allow Polly to see the children on Wednesday. Melissa accompanied them to Polly's parents' place and provided a supporting presence throughout their stay. Fred's next encounter with Polly occurred at their appointment with the lawyers in the attorney's office, where their marriage would be legally dissolved. Polly's lawyer made a series of requests, forcing the friend to rise and ready to leave. We've just started. Where are you going? The attorney inquired. Fred said quietly, I'll say this once. The terms remain as they are. Polly will have visitation rights, but physical custody will be mine. I refuse to let my children witness the birth of her illegitimate child conceived with another guy. They challenged me on this or anything else, and I will not hesitate to reveal the truth about my soon-to-be ex-wife. So, before you talk again, please think carefully about your next step. After a brief break to settle tensions, the proceedings continued. Polly, in tears, agreed to the requirements of her pals, and they all signed the forms. I really apologize, Fred. I'm not sure how I allowed this to happen. I loved you, Polly wailed. I assume not enough, Fred said calmly as he went. Friend turned back to Polly. Since you conceived a child during a team-building class, perhaps you can claim it as a work-related accident and request compensation, he said with a sardonic chuckle before walking away for the last time. Thank you for viewing this video until the end. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe to the channel. See you shortly.